Greetings to all of my South American colleagues. It is a great pleasure and honor to be asked to present these data. These data are being presented because there really is a lot to appropriate thrombosis risk assessment, selection of a protocol, implementation of the protocol, and also uh, validating and uh, recording the results for quality improvement. Now, why should someone use the Caprini score in, in addition to the other scores? Well, for one thing, it's the most comprehensive history and physical involving 40 elements. And it's the only risk assessment to include both family history of thrombosis and obstetrical complications. And I'd like to emphasize both of those problems in just a minute. It's validated in more than 180 studies in over 5 million surgical patients and 20 studies in medical patients. It's validated in all the major surgical populations. And it has successfully been used worldwide during the past 30 years. Hospital-wide compliance also is facilitated by having this comprehensive risk assessment score available for everyone. So let us talk about the specific features in addition to the number of factors involved in this score. Family history. Family history is a risk indicator for a first venous thrombosis, regardless of other, the risk fact, other risk factors identified. In clinical practice, family history may be more useful for risk assessment than thrombophilia testing. It has been shown a number of years ago, actually, the patients with a positive family history almost 30% had a genetic risk factor, and the chance of finding a genetic risk factor was up to 36% for patients with several affected relatives. <clears throat> the relative risk associated with a positive factory family history was of similar magnitude as the risk associated with a genetic factor. Remember even that many of these patients do not have an identifiable risk factor, but they are still at increased risk for thrombosis. This excellent study, I'm surprised, has not gotten more attention. It's 183,000 patients followed over 25 years, and the study shows an increased VTE risk not only among first-degree relatives, but also second-degree relatives and third-degree relatives going down in, in risk uh, and then even a slight increased risk for those who have, uh, who, who live together, uh, loved ones, uh, significant others, uh, uh, and so forth. And um, so this is a very important thing to consider. The value of a family history, it may reflect family genetic risk factors. Carriers of a genetic risk factor we know are at increased risk of a first venous thrombosis, particularly when exposed to environmental triggers. Those environmental triggers may include surgery, muscle ruptures, immobilization, plaster casts, extended bed rest. And remember, if a patient is non-weight bearing, there is no increase of blood flow in that calf, and therefore that leg is at risk for thrombosis. Hospitalization, pregnancy, oral contraceptives, diagnosis of malignancy uh, before or six months after the index date are also uh, factors associated with uh, risk indicators for venous thrombosis. These facts and these uh, uh, risk factors which are acquired intensify the value of a thorough risk assessment. Now let us turn to obstetrical history as a marker for thrombotic events. We're specifically looking at patients who have a history, even many years before, of recurrent unplanned abortions, stillbirths, premature birth with toxemia, growth-restricted infant. And patients with these historical events may be carriers of one or more of the following abnormalities, including lupus anticoagulant, uh, single uh, anticardiolipin antibody positive, or beta-2 glycoprotein 1 antibody positive. And if there is a single defect, there's, a, there's an increased risk, but it goes up with a double and triple uh, uh, abnormalities being present. And remember that a patient who's older, who's undergoing a serious operation, may have this obstetrical history in the past and may be carrying this thrombophilia marker 
which then will make them at greatly increased risk of thrombosis because it's a strong predictor of a thrombotic event following surgery. Now, unfortunately, the, although the Caprini score has many advantages, it's, it's capturing all 40 elements as a time-consuming process. And certainly at the time of trauma or admission for COVID-19 with a very seriously ill patient, it's very hard to sit down and go through a family history and all of those things. So we advocate doing a patient family history, and we advocate that patients all do it before they're really patients. All people do this and sit down with your families, go through all the risk factors, come up with a score, present that score to your physician, and have the physician help to validate the score and put it in your record. We have worked very hard due to a number of brilliant people that work w with me and uh, in association with them. Uh, we've produced a, a, a patient-friendly form which has been validated in a number of languages compared to physician-related uh, risk assessment. And you can see here it's a relatively straightforward form. It's in hopefully patient-friendly language. And it also includes, which we will talk about later, some newer factors that have popped up since the original score. And I want you all to remember that if this score isn't done ahead of time, that the score should only be done by someone who is trained to do histories and physicals. It could be a nurse practitioner, it could be a physician assistant, many times it's a physician. But floor nurses who have a million other duties, uh, surgery nurses uh, in the surgery unit that have other duties, they're not trained to do histories and physicals and that's not their job. And by doing that, you endanger the validity of this method because it's very difficult to devote the time and effort to it that's necessary if you're not trained to do histories and physicals. The other thing to remember about this scoring tool, you know, just do it at, at admission. During, during the hospitalization, reoperations, infections, central lines, cancer, many things can occur. And when they do, an updated score often will result in a change of the thrombosis prophylaxis, especially post-discharge anticoagulant prophylaxis. So this is a dynamic instrument. Now all this is well and good, but there is a disconnect between evidence-based and execution of the risk assessment as it relates to VTE pre prevention. And I would encourage you as we've been asked, what are the steps to encourage compliance? Well, first you take a unit and study the unit for 90 days by doing all of the risk assessment, risk assessment in all of those patients and do it blindly. Do it blindly, independently, making sure all the questions are asked. And then see, after following these patients for 90 days, who gets a clot? And then compare that rate to those who received prophylaxis and what it was and so forth. And, and, and in most cases, you will see that those people that aren't using prophylaxis or not doing assessment to guide their prophylaxis, there will be a discrepancy and they will have a higher incidence of thrombosis. And then you schedule a formal meeting with a physician, and usually the chief does this, to discuss improving the compliance with recommended prophylaxis protocols to improve personal VTE rates. And following that, so I wouldn't do it as a first step. I would first show the doctors what their own results might be. But then you should get into a mandatory phase where, where prophylactic protocols based on risk assessment should be mandated and the orders signed only when those orders are also signed unless there's a contraindication. And of course, a physician always has the opportunity to opt out for valid clinical concerns. This next section discusses one of the most frequent frustrating things that I encounter in dealing with risk assessment using the Caprini score. <clears throat> Excuse me. The original three studies that were used to calculate the highest risk and were uh, used by CHESS to recommend the score in the first place, there are only three studies, and they described a set point as five and above as the highest risk. Well, now we have 180 studies looking at the relationship between the score number and the clinical VTE incidence 
and and that that five is no longer true all across the board. And the highest risk depends upon the group tested. As a matter of fact, the relationship between the rising score and the incidence of venous thromboembolism clinically differs with different certain populations. And there's particularly differences seen between general surgery, otolaryngology, joint replacement, and hip fractures. Here we see in general surgery that the risk goes up pretty much as you get up above five to six, seven to eight, and then of course above eight. But now look at head and neck, all the way up to five to six factors, very low incidence of venous thrombosis. These patients are at much lower risk until they hit the high point when they're over eight, their risk goes to 18%, whereas it was only 8% uh, in the, uh, six and a half percent, sorry, in the general surgical uh, population. Now let's take a look at plastic surgery. 60 days out, 11% of patients who had plastic surgical procedures and no prophylaxis have a clot if their score was above eight. So you have 11% here, you have 6% here, you have 18% here, and a, uh, a, here's the surgical ICU, which is a more algorithmic or linear correlation with the incidence of thrombosis and the score. The Boston program very successfully used scores of, of 0 to 4 with optional anticoagulation and 5 to 8 uh, anticoagulation for 7 to 10 days, and then very high risk scores for, for uh, 30 days. I would remind you, not to forget that based on the original KCAR trial in 1975 and 28 hospitals in 4,000 patients, and then buffered by the 70 additional trials in the Colin meta-analysis in 19, by 1988, so that by 1988, you're up to, to uh, 20,000 patients in 98 trials around the world, which showed that the use of heparin, unfractionated heparin, in surgical patients produced a six, or resulted in a 66% risk reduction in the incidence of fatal venous thromboembolic problems. And it produced a, 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 a dramatic decrease from 30% to around 10% in the incidence of overall uh, uh, screened patients for DVT. And one must remember, what was the duration? It was seven to 10 days. There are no trials that show one or two days to give the kind of results. So we've known since 1988 that you need to give a week of prophylaxis, but that's still not being practiced, and we'll come back to that later. Let's look at some other groups. Let's take a look at almost 3 million patients in 4, million Vietnam, in four Vietnamese hospitals over a two-year period. And a brilliant job to collect all of these data and look at the increase in score and how that relates to the increase in venous thromboembolism. And 4.5% of almost 3 million patients had a clot if their score was greater than 8. Now let's take a look from China at patients with lung surgery. And as you can see, low-risk patients, 0 to 4, uh, none of them got a clot. But if they were moderate risk, 12% got a clot. And look at this, 40% in the highest-risk patients. So you can see, depending on the surgical population, the, the, the algorithm is different, and you have to establish the algorithm for your own population. Now, Christopher Panucci, in, actually in 2017, put together 13 of the best initial trials done with a Caprini score, and he found that a score of six or less was in 75% of the patients, and no significant reduction of VTE was found in this group and mechanical prophylaxis was suggested. So we, uh, taking low-risk patients and trying to give them anticoagulation doesn't really lower their VTE rate. So you have to have the population right. There's a famous medical study with 60,000 medical patients in it, and the overall incidence of venous thrombosis is 1.8%, and they said the Caprini score doesn't work. And there were a number of problems with that, but one of the problems with that certainly was the fact that they were looking at low-risk patients. You can't lower the risk any further when you have low-risk patients. On the other hand, as the scores go up 7, 8, and beyond, the risk goes up, as you've been shown in various populations. And I would remind you that in this initial analysis, those patients that had a score of over 8 
10% of them got a clot. So if those patients aren't properly risk assessed and given the proper prophylaxis, there can be very serious consequences. Now, a number of questions are related to the fact that we have various risk assessments. The main one in 2005 has been validated in most of the trials, but there's been more uh, come out in 2010 and 2013. So I'd like to remind you that we've found since the original 2005 data that there are other data and other diseases that are important to consider in patients. And you can't say, well, we used the Caprini score of 2005, so even though I have an insulin-dependent diabetic who's had cancer and on chemotherapy and maybe he's getting a blood transfusion and has a five-hour operation, that we can't score any of those or, or, or count those as increased risk. Of course you can. We don't know exactly how much, but these are additional risk factors. And this is subject to further study. And we make it very clear that in the 2013 version, these extra factors were not validated in the original version, but they're still significant risk factors for thrombosis. Also, on the right-hand side of this slide, you will see things like sleep apnea, sickle cell, autoimmune disease, hemoly autoimmune hemolytic anemia, uh, marijuana, multiple myeloma, and abdominoplasty. These are all additional risk factors that require further study, but they should be considered. Now that brings me to an important point. Risk assessment of the patient does not consist of taking your favorite risk assessment score, be it uh, Padua, Improve, Improve D, uh, Caprini, uh, the British Health uh, score, and then you consider that your risk assessment process for the patient. No, no, no. The risk assessment process for the patient has at least now, six elements in my view. First, there are evidence-based guidelines. So if you have a patient that exactly fits evidence-based guidelines for, your, for the situation, then you follow the evidence-based guidelines. But as we know, evidence-based guidelines are based on patients who are at moderate risk for thrombosis because most of those trials involve a, a control group, and it's not ethical to put patients with a lot of risk factors into the control group. So right away, you've got a problem with evidence-based guidelines. In addition to that, evidence-based guidelines uh, may be years old, and so subsequent literature that's come out since the last guideline, that has to be considered. And then there are special situations, and we cannot ignore the wonderful worldwide RIETE database, which now has almost 100,000 patients in it, several hundred hospitals, and these are real-world data. These are patients who developed a clot, and their doctors put the data into the database. How did they get the clot? What were their risk factors? How were they treated? And what were their outcomes in the real world? And so that may be an important guide for you if you have a patient that doesn't fit the other groups. The classic example would be a patient that's in ICU with a cerebral hemorrhage, and then two weeks later develops a, fatal, a serious pulmonary embolus, how do you treat that? Well, if you look at the RIEDA database, it'll tell you that if more than two weeks have elapsed since the original bleed, then it's probably better to give the patient anticoagulation, whereas if it's less than two weeks, it's probably better not to give the patient anticoagulation. So, but now, and then now we get to risk assessment models. You can use any one of a number of risk assessment models out there. I've only listed three of them here. That's all well and good. But then in addition to that, you have to also consider unique surgical procedures. For example, abdominoplasty has a higher than anticipated incidence of thrombosis than other equivalent procedures, and so that requires an extra consideration. And now COVID-19 induces a whole new level of complexity to the risk assessment process. And then finally, there's clinical experience and judgment. You had a patient who, was, who had an injury to the leg, uh, maybe he was hit by a car, had a um, compound fracture of the lower extremity, tibia and fibula. It was repaired. Patient was on weight bearing, uh, but the patient didn't get prophylaxis because the guidelines don't recommend routine prophylaxis for lower extremity fractures. Patient dies. So you come back and you take another look and you say, that wasn't a very good outcome. So the next time we have a patient like that, maybe I'm going to use anticoagulation. And that actually, when I go back and read the fine print of the guideline, it says patients with additional risk factors, prophylaxis should be considered. But some people interpret that as just cancer 
and history of venous thrombosis, because those were the two examples used for extra risk factors. So in every, any, any event, with clinical experience comes judgment, and you have bad outcomes, you do your best to improve those outcomes by altering your approach to the patient. Now I'd like to switch gears to, just very briefly, to COVID-19. And we've known for many, many years that the activation of contact, the contact activation system will activate, through Hegeman factor, will activate platelets, coagulation, fibrinolysis, complement, and calocrine systems. So with that will come thrombosis, fibrinolysis, increased vascular permeability, vasodilatation, bradycardia, increased vascular permeability, angioedema, histamine release. Now, in addition to that, that's all going on because of activation of clotting and COVID-19. But in addition to that, COVID-19 is a very powerful virus, and the viral spikes enter the endothelial cells all over the body, facilitated by ACE2, and wreak havoc. And this uh, clotting cascade and contact activation is, is intensified many, many times. And unfortunately, we're still looking at things. If we're clotters, we're looking at the thrombosis side. If we're inflammatory physicians, we're looking at the inflammatory pathways and complement. And if we're, of course, uh, uh, immunologists, we're looking at antigen, anti antigen antibody pathways and so on and so forth, calocrine and, and bradykinins and so forth. But taken from the words of Oscar Ratnoff, and I'd like to repeat that, I'd like to read that to you, it's important. When he described the tangled web, which is what I've just shown you, we think about clotting, fibrinolysis, immune reactions, and inflammation as if they were separate and separable processes. In truth, these distinctions are mainly man-made. In real life, it is the body as a whole that responds to the injury. The processes through which it defends itself are interlocked like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. We may be intrigued by the intricate pieces of this puzzle, but the picture emerges only when they are put together. Very powerful words from a brilliant man. We have decided to um, assign points to COVID-19 patients as follows. Asymptomatic, two. Coronavirus, positive, three. And if the D-dimer is positive, five. And then, of course, you have to add all the other risks in the risk assessment. And right now, there's a paper under consideration that the Journal of Vascular Surgery and Lymphatic Diseases, where Kirill Lobostov from, from Moscow has tested this postulate successfully in his country. But we need a lot more data. This is just a straw man I'm putting up. You know, feel free to knock it down, but I'd like to see you um, take the next steps with it. I want to go back to a minute to show you the Collins meta-analysis data. And of course, there were these... The, 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 these are two groups of patients, and they represent 70 trials collected over 15 years, and 6,000 patients in each group. And as you can see, the incidence of fatal pulmonary emboli was reduced by a relative risk reduction of 66%. At the same time, there was no increase for bleeding. And note, prophylaxis was continued for one week. There are no data that refute this analysis. As a matter of fact, in CHESS 2012, there are 51 trials involving heparin and low molecular weight heparin that validate these findings, and they were all with a, 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 a length of prophylaxis of one week. Now let's go back in history. And my wonderful um, fellow who had, I had the honor to work with for three years, Juan Arcelis, who's now a professor in Granada, produced this manuscript from the Riete database showing that over three quarters of patients after they went home from the hospital, regardless of why they were in the hospital, that's when they got their DVT. And out of that, over half of them, once anticoagulation was stopped. Now in 2017, uh, there was another paper out authored by, uh, with Jeffrey Weiss, who's the current ISTH president, that indicates the same kind of percentages and now there's a paper under consideration in the Journal of uh, Vascular Surgery and Lymphatic Diseases by Juan, uh, repeating this in the modern era. Uh, 
You know what? It hasn't changed. Why in the world were we stopping anticoagulation when we've known for years and years that most of the events occurred after hospitalization? We won't get into all of those reasons. But now, COVID-19 injects a whole new layer of complexity and a whole new layer of risk in these patients. Now, based on that, several months ago, we put out some preliminary results uh, and preliminary suggestions from a panel from the American Venus Forum. And one of the things that we uh, considered was doing serial measurements and giving everybody heparin or low molecular weight heparin, um, and of course adjusted for renal insufficiency, or in, in, uh, in cases of, of, of elevated BMI, increasing the dose. We also decided that if they presented with scores of eight or more, that we give them double dose and also provided therapeutic anticoagulation for some patients who had a high D-dimer, and not to use the DOAX uh, during the inpatient setting. And since, that, since those regulations, or not regulations, but suggestions have been put out, there's been a lot of banter back and forth. But in general, uh, what I've seen in the articles is a trend more and more toward giving more and more anticoagulation earlier and earlier, and we still haven't seen significant increases in bleeding. Um, no higher than 3% in most series. Now, another thing I'd like to point out, and this, this is something that, that, uh, that I find particularly concerning. We already know in the pre-COVID-19 era that batrixaban and rivaroxaban not only were approved for in-hospital and extended thromboprophylaxis in high-risk medically ill patients at low risk of bleeding, but that that this affects more than 25% of the medically ill patients. Now, especially uh, if, you're, if your um, hospital is already using um, the improved D-dimer uh, uh, risk assessment, for example, which is very, very well validated in these populations, 60% of all VTE events, again, here we're seeing, occur after hospital discharge with 80% occurring in six weeks. Despite these data, less than 4% of patients are sent home on prophylaxis. The symptomatic VTE rate more than doubles during the first three weeks, and a five-fold increase in fatal events occurs within 45 days. You have ADOPT, Magellan, Mariner, and Apex trials that have all shown the value of, the, of anticoagulation following discharge in these patients. And uh, using the Padua Improve and Improve D-dimer scores now, I'm not talking about the Caprini score. So, this was before COVID-19. Well, my Lord, since COVID-19, we have a whole new level of complexity. And I don't understand why guidelines don't say. We already know these data pre-COVID era. Until we know better, wouldn't it be prudent to apply these data to the COVID patients? Because, you know, for example, one out of eight goes home on oxygen, and many patients decreased ambulation, heart failure, uh, pulmonary insufficiency, and so forth, and other comorbidities. So I'd like you to think about all of this. This is the algorithm, and I'd like to also look at the latest article that, from Alex Spiropoulos that I've seen that is a very good article that summarizes this whole area. And I think that especially for those of you already using the scores, that this is important information. Remember, there are many roads to Rome. And so with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention and wish you all a very successful symposium. And please all visit my website at venusdisease.com, YouTube, Venus Resource Center, also Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And please, everyone, stay safe and have a wonderful day. Thank you very much for your attention.